So we're live streaming um, this um, onto into the virtual world, but we're also going to live stream it straight into other podcasts as well. So everything you see is going to be live streamed. It's also going to be on Apple and Google podcasts by uh, the end of this session. So we're just going to go straight into it. We've got 30 minutes podcast uh, and we are going to um, ask Paul anything, which I know sounds quite surprising and daunting, um, but yes, so <laughs> maybe for you, yep. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to ask Paul anything and uh, what we should be getting on the screen, and hopefully everyone can see it, uh, is now uh, we're going to do this live. So I'm going to... Awesome. Well, welcome, Paul Gerard, to the live streamed Virtual Community Days podcast, brought to you by Vivit and our partners, Unicom. Okay, Paul, um, we've got Slido up. We're gonna have live uh, questions from today's audience combined with some questions that I know that you wanna hear. So do you wanna just uh, give us a quick introduction uh, to kind of what you've just talked about and set the scene? Um, well, I think for... Um, getting on for 30 years, I've been working in the kind of test automation arena back in the good old days of green screens and character-based um, uh, ter character terminals up to today. And uh, in some ways, the principles haven't changed, but the technology has moved on just dramatically. Um, but I think our thinking about um, automation is still a little bit stuck in the past. And um, I'm just kind of I do my usual thing and try and sort of you know, provide a vision of, of how I see using machine learning and AI to its best advantage as part of our uh, goal of improving our testers a lot, uh, not to replace testers, but to support what we do. And my uh, focus in that area is to say, well, look, if machine learning and AI is to help us in any way at all, it's got to support our thinking. So uh, what I call the new model for testing is a model of the thought processes a tester goes through. So I'm using that as the basis of saying, look, where do tools fit in terms of support of our thinking against that model? So I'm just trying to explain uh, the use of machine learning and AI in a more simple way. So, you know, your middle of the middle of the road testers can say, oh, I see where we're headed. And it's also a plea to the vendors to say, to, well, to listen to us, to be, to be honest to say, look, what we really, really need is not more and more and more and more efficient test execution automation. We need uh, exploration, test design, test analysis, um, uh, results analysis, defect uh, analysis. We need stuff in those areas to help us make better decisions and potentially to take some of those decisions automatically. So the talk was really all about uh, setting the scene of a, or a vision, if you like, of where I, I would hope uh, tools will be in the next few years or be going in the next few years. Uh, whether that's successful or correct, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Is Absolutely. That okay? Well, I think that's a great introduction. And I loved you when you kicked off today's uh, conference. You kind of said that, um, you know, you broke uh, areas down to different methodologies. And I know we're going to get onto this kind of question next. Uh, but I actually did a I did a conference last night at um, uh, for in a for an RPA event in in Melbourne, and I was kind of um, I I kind of was taking what you we we kind of talked about and and what David uh, also mentioned uh, around Agile turning twenty and um, you know and also what Giles had mentioned about Agile's dead, you know long live agility and you know I and also kind of where you know the seraphim frameworks kind of come in some of your thought process and, and last night i kind of said well actually you know it's not you know it's not a one size fits all it's in one way um you know it's the waterfall is still very applicable for many projects and i and i refer waterball uh, waterfall to um the core it landscape so 60 percent of what businesses do to keep the lights on that are doing, you know, uh, engineering practices. So, you know, the, the, what we would normally have seen as requirement engineering, all the great stuff that's been there for the last hundred years. And then we've got this 30% where we've moved into the adaptive IT, you know, where, you know, Gartner and everyone are seeing core IT and adaptive IT, um, you know, where you've got 
uh, people d practicing agile or you know com the conversation we had yesterday around manuf bringing some of the techniques from manufacturing whether that be lean whether that be the Toyota model you know to uh, and, and applying that into kind of what what has now turned into kind of this agile approach where uh, where things are I guess if we're looking at the seraphin stuff we're all kind of um, you know obvious you know the, the known uh, knowns in core IT kind of moved to kind of that complicated known unknowns for agile and then we got this final one which is where I think what you've just mentioned makes so much sense and that what we've kind of called cognitive engineering which is this um, fluid um, um, fluid IT which is you know where things are fail fast learn rapid experiments using machine learning and artificial intelligence and actually I think you know that is maybe 10 percent of what we're seeing people to do doing with intelligent process automation and all these other great techniques so during the conference which is what i wanted to kind of get get uh, uh, you, you kind of kicked off with was you know dave yesterday kind of had two big statements to well to, uh, to giles on more of an agile day and he kind of said agile is dead you know and also agile's a cult and i know you kind of addressed that this morning and he was kind of saying well you know what is the next evolution of agile in the same way you know you talked about devops being a separate discipline and continuous integration and uh, deployment being a separate discipline actually you know are we looking at uh, that final frontier of chaotic the you know kind of landscape what we're seeing with the with the virus and uh, and how we're having to change the way we do business completely to be a whole new type of methodology which may be born uh, february 17 2021 um when we we sign the the agile manifesto again or re-sign the digital manifesto uh is that a question or a <laughs> it's, um, it's, i think i think my, my pitch on on um i think, I think I, let me step back from the you know the the the, uh, the firefight that might evolve from saying agile is dead um there are there are there are three modes of development at, you know, which are popular at the moment, Water, waterfall, structured, agile, and continuous delivery, which I see as not agile. It's a very different discipline from agile. Uh, it's got more in common with waterfall than it has it with, with agile, I would say. So there, are, so there are three modes of working. Actually, no, there's an infinite number because nobody, apart from some real, really focused organizations, do pure waterfall, pure agile, or pure continuous delivery. Everybody else does a hybrid, a mix of perhaps all three with different proportions. And so everyone does it differently. So what kind of an industry are we? That everybody be behaves and, and works differently. We're in a, it's a shambles. And I don't think we're gonna get to the bottom of that uh, anytime soon because it suits some organizations and some, and a lot of people to keep it that way because it's good business, you know? So anyway, so let's not go on that one. But what I think, uh is happening is waterfall is very well understood where it's appropriate i think agile is nowadays very well understood as a philosophy rather than an, a, a, a process or a method um, and it's being commoditized you know and so if you like uh there will be kind of off-the-shelf versions of agile which we can pick up and use and find no problem at all but for the rest of us we're, we've got to kind of deal with this issue of everybody working differently. And so I think we should move away from what you might call linear processes, um, which is what uh, Waterfall is, and Agile, you know, exists to eliminate uh, uh, processes in that respect. But we got Scrum instead, which again is a kind of iterative, but it's still linear in terms of you follow a cyclic process. And continuous delivery is often presented as this infinite loop. But if you unwrap that infinite loop, it's waterfall. It's a staged process. And so I think we need to sort of stop thinking in these terms of staged processes and uh, do what I think of in terms of what I would call like an event-driven process where we don't know what's coming next. We don't know whether there's going to be a, a, a an anomaly in production or a bug found in, in, in development or a piece of infrastructure failing in our test environment. We don't know what's coming or a new requirement that's imposed because COVID just landed on our desk, you know? Um, so if we don't know what's coming, we've got to be super agile. And the only thing that is flexible enough to deal with that kind of stuff is our brain. And if we understand how we think and how we can think through a solution to a problem, 
the logistics come second. So do we need to write lots of stuff down? Do we need to follow a very well-defined process? Do we get a crisis management team together? And like Drew's example yesterday of his house flooding, you know, I mean, we never know what's coming. So we need a, a processes that can deal with the unexpected. And we're never going to be in a perfect place because we don't know what's coming, but we can be better prepared than we are at the moment. And I think that's, I don't think there's enough thinking along, along those lines. And that's why I talk endlessly about thinking and testers, how they think, how developers, I think 80% is exactly the same. For, for developers, uh, and I think that's the direction we should go in and, and look at much more dynamic, uh, event-driven processes rather than these linear, you know, flowcharts and and trim lane kind of diagrams that we have to follow. Does that makes sense, <laughs> kind of. No, that, that's that's perfect. And uh, you know, I, I've skipped forwards a few bit. I'll, I'll I'll move backwards and forwards as questions come through as well. But you know, we've talked about a, a methodology that you you kind of came up with around humble humbled right the idea that exactly what you're talking about with this human aspect of it that and i think partly day one with with theo kind of said that you know actually this is a really interesting area that actually human how we evolve those cognitive skills and you know those ologies which i know dave also brought up you know part of it is how we do that thinking and you know we've talked about in the past things like solution thinking systems thinking and and maybe uh, you know exploring some of these things like CBT for cognitive behavior therapy, applying some of those ways that humans interact with each other, and maybe that's the the skills gap that we're potentially missing. So you know going yeah. back to that, you know do you want to talk through these steps in a little bit of detail, starting with the thinking? What well, these on the screen? Because that's if, not my if, slide. It's your slide, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to pass on that, but what I would say, I mean, what, what I mean by that is um, there are modes of think, there are ways of thinking and communicating, which is comes a very close second to thinking, okay, uh, that will help us have a better understanding of our world. And we need to understand uh, what I would call the definition of the software, the systems that we need to build. Uh, and it could be a requirement in all its glory, or it could be a user story, or it could be something written in a formal language or a piece of maths. Who knows? The old system, the new can tell us what the new system should do in certain areas. Um, and so we need this kind of critical faculty to understand the sources of information. And by and large, we usually have multiple sources of information because there are people involved who have opinions and prejudices and bias, biases and, and, and preferences. And we need to sort of um, somehow analyze all that to come up with a, a shared vision for what the system should do, which is shared clearly with the developers too who are going to build the damn thing. And with that shared vision, a model, because I think you could substitute uh, the word model for understanding either way, it's the same. How we understand is basically how, how we build mental models that, that simplify our view of the world, if you like. So I think what I'm trying to suggest with all this is that everything is logistics except our thinking and uh, our logistics are choices we make to best deal with a situation in hand. So in some occasions it's best to uh, document things in triplicate, in other situations it's a good enough to have a conversation in a corridor and just a, a nod and a wink and a, and a, and a, and a human agreement to, to, to work a certain way for the next hour. Uh, we have to understand how we make use of our brains and then settle into some kind of logistical approach. And um, I think the challenge we've had over the past 30 years is we've tended to look at one approach fits all, and that was waterfall in the, in, in the day. Uh, right now, it's everyone wants to go agile, and then we've got advocates of continuous delivery, DevOps, and all that other good stuff coming up on the rail, you know. I think, well, wait a minute. I mean, in five years' time, we'll have another way and another way and another way. So I think we need to step back from having these one size fits all processes, but have this kind of event driven, more dynamic uh, resolution. It's a bit like crisis management. And maybe you know, Drew's analogy yesterday with his house flooding is a good one in that really we need a crisis management approach. It's not a crisis, it's just the way we work, but, but we need to be ready for anything. And I think that's the only way we're going to make progress. I, I don't think in 20 years time, if we're all alive, you know, um, that we'll be, uh, we'll be any further ahead at the rate we're going. We'll just have 
oh, uh, you know, Agile 5, <laughs> and I don't think we'll be much more effective at building systems. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the picture you've put on, on the table, because we did this, it was like a very informal thing, and you came up with this brilliant picture, uh, humbled. Um, all that stuff is the stuff we have to understand. And some of it is logistical, and some of it is incredibly complex. And we just need to uh, have a better way of understanding complexity. So Kanefin may be you know, one way of doing it, and, and Dave's work in that area is fascinating. I think we need to understand how we think much better, and I think we need to understand how we communicate complexity through models. So we have to, you know, because we're, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but I guess this is what a podcast is all about. <laughs> Um, we need to have a better understanding of how to gather information, to explore in the broadest sense, not just software, but text, conversations, all that kind of good stuff. We need to understand how to make uh, rational choices. We need to understand how to be critical of our sources so we can see through uh, fallacious thinking or you know, uh, information. And we need to model a lot better. And if AI, machine learning and AI can help us to build better models. That will be a great help and assistance. And if machine learning and AI can give us visualizations of the complexity of our uh, operational systems and tell us what's going on there, I think that's a fantastic input to our thinking as requirements definers, you know, our users trying to build a business requirement, if you like, but also to our developers who will understand where the volumes are, where the hotspots are, what goes wrong, why it goes wrong, uh, or the patterns of failure that, that seem to be uh, in there, because we're capturing all that data now. We're logging everything. We've got databases and tools to manipulate data at fantastic speeds, and, and so on. So there's a load of stuff that I think we need to get our heads around. And it's not a process thing. It's a, how can we leverage our brains to think through stuff that takes experienced people 20 years to gather you know it takes 20 years to get their experience and and you know you know every you know like richard was talking you know from the perspective of uh, lloyd's banking group today i mean there'll be people in lloyd's who've worked for lloyd's for 35 years on the systems only those people have the understanding and the and are trusted and credi the credibility to say you know what we don't need to run those regression tests this week we, we can take we can take that shortcut and that, that's kind of where machine learning and AI can help us tremendously, you know? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I completely agree. And, and, you know, part of, and again, this kind of um, idea of domain and context specific kind of knowledges, um, you know, systems of knowledge, you know, like you mentioned, kind of, you could spend your entire career in the derivative landscape or in the healthcare landscape and, you know, only scratch the surface. And, and what I really liked about, I guess, going back to what Dave said yesterday as well, which was another uh, Davidism, I suppose, uh, shall we say, was, you know, he was saying, well, you know, the IT landscape, uh, the IT landscape is a shambles. You know, the people who are working IT, um, they just don't have that formalized structure. And it's something that's maybe not taught at, uh, at, at universities. Um, and, you know, I guess that was what Theo was kind of saying about the fact that, you know, with the, uh, the the example we were kind of mentioning about killing creativity and and, and Sir Ken Robinson's talk, uh, TED talk about, you know, are we, you know, going for the wrong kind of skills, you know, encouraging children to code and not, you know, do yeah. performing arts and so on and so forth. And, you know, part <laughs> of it is, is, is what is that structure that comes out? And, you know, a massive thanks to, uh, you know, the professional sponsors today as well. I know we had the... Um, the Institute of uh, Testing Board, um, and we also had the BCS committee, and I'm lucky to be on the BCS committee, and, and we've been kind of again looking at well, how do we bring, you know, you know, qualifications and specialisms and and all these kind of supporting mechanisms to really help professional development, and um, you know, part of that I know you've been speaking to Debbie today, you know, and and people will have different uh, viewpoints on whether or not. You know, you go down the ISTQ route or you go down, uh, you know, some kind of apprenticeship route or, or, or a mixture of both. And yeah, I sent this over today and it was kind of or this morning. So one o'clock in the morning last night, I was just 
um, you know, uh, finished my conference. Um, I, I'm doing five conferences in 24 hours was maybe too much. My brain was just talk, continuously spinning about stuff that we talked about. And maybe this this kind of how do we move the industry forwards? Uh, and, you know, I, I sent this across this morning just as a bit of a placeholder with, um, you know, the idea of a, an institution of, of business technology and leadership. And I know you're incredibly passionate about the technology and leadership uh, and you've even got uh, the technology and leadership forum, which you, you host. But, you know, I think part of where we've kind of bridged the gap and I kind of guess what we were, we, we, we talked about over the last couple of days is, is bring, you know, maybe that front, final frontier is less focused on IT as an industry and actually more bringing in the, the gap the, with the business, right? And we're talking about, you know, pr uh, product engineering, bringing product and engineering. Seth, Seb talked about it today about, you know, bringing your customer in to the conversation. You know, business have been, you know, giving money as, uh, to fund IT projects. And, you know, again, Gartner this year talked about the fact that you shouldn't be funding uh, projects, you should be funding products. But product then means, you know, you, you go hand in hand with the business. Exactly what you said with Lloyd's is, you know, you need the business as well as the technology. So when we we're talking about skills, we're not talking about being just fantastic at, um, you know, automation. We're talking about what skills do we need or what plethora of, of different uh, skills do we need to arm ourselves so we understand the business context, the technology context, and also be able to become leaders in this new landscape. Um, so, you know, I think we've got a long way to go. And, you know, I think we're taking those baby steps towards, you know, maybe something like you said, Agile X.0. But, you know, what's going to be needed to stop looking at it as a manufacturing, applying manufacturing processes, but manufacturing, thinking about business and, and, and technology and how that changes paces. Like you said, multimodal, it goes between core IT and fluid IT and backwards and forwards. We're sometimes talking about requirements. Sometimes we're talking about stories. We're talking about capabilities. And I think. You know, we need to all come together. And we've talked about this in this kind of fusion landscape of bringing, you know, everyone getting together, the developers, the testers, the project managers, the UX designers, you know, the business specialists, everybody needs to be in there. And I think there's a lot to be learned. Um, mm. So, again, you know, coming back to this landscape of, you know, what do we need to arm this next generation of of, of I'm not going to call them testers. I'm not going to call them agileists. I'm not going to call them anything apart from kind of engineers or, um, or you know, specialists, you know, what, what kind of skills do they need to be thinking about? Well, I, I think, I, I don't know if I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but um, if, if you like, um, in the software business, it's a bit like civil engineering, let's say, although I don't think software is, a civil, is an engineering discipline, but whatever. Um, you know, we build, um, you know, garden sheds, we build houses, we build um uh tower blocks we build uh you know 70 story skyscrapers we build bridges whatever and with software and, and with engineer in civil engineering we've got this huge range of stuff the techniques and approaches and tools and technologies we use vary depending on the project with regards to software it's much worse than that because we can build literally anything that has a function a function piece of functionality uh, using code, we can imagine anything of any scale almost. And so uh, we need to stop thinking that there's one solution to this problem of, of building software systems. So, you know, Waterfall was never the solution to all our ills. Agile certainly isn't the solution to all our ills. Continuous delivery offers some prospects of uh, whatever, but it, again, it's a very focused tool. We simply haven't got, we need, we need about another 20 tools. And then if we have these 20 tools, imagine you had the tools, which would be from um, a spade, a trowel, a bucket, and some water and some cement and sand, uh, to having the kind of tools you need to move mountains, literally, to build dams. You know, what we need are the ability to make good choices of our tools. And our tools are basically logistics, as I've tried to, you know, this is what I'm trying to pitch. It's like, if you can imagine something, whether it's a, a tiny piece of code or it's a a uh, 100 million line operating system, lines of code operating system, we need, our brains need to be able to make good choices of tools 
from the set of tools that exist. And the problem is we still don't have tools that help us to model systems to the degree, you know, the, to model complexity to the degree that uh, they help uh, designers, developers to build stuff and testers to test stuff. So uh, I think essentially the tools we really need are, are tools that support our thinking and do some of the log this logistical stuff that can be done by software, like moving mountains of data from here to there, uh, scanning um, all our bug reports and all our source code changes and all our change requests and, and looking for patterns of failure and success and, and so on. These are the things we need and, and we don't have them yet. And so we don't have, we, we've got some point solutions for um, managing work. And if you like, uh, waterfall and, and, and you know, waterfall structured processes and Scrum are ways of managing work. Kanban, you know, is a way of managing work. And the thing is, like, that's absolutely fine. But it helps us not one bit to deal with complexity. And complexity is the problem we're trying to solve. You know, even, even 100 lines of code can be immensely complicated. You know, we've all, we've all, you know, if you've ever written code, you know, once you get over sort of 30 or 40 lines, you have to think really carefully about changing it. It's as simple as that. When you've got 30 or 40 million lines of code in a, in a banking system, it's overwhelming. And we rely on people who have these kind of mystical properties, mystical capabilities who can say, uh, you know what, this will be a safe change to do tonight. Uh, this one might not be, you know, <laughs> and we don't know. We can't capture that knowledge in any way except by having people work on the same system for, for, for dozens of years, perhaps, you know. So I, I think we, we are, you know, it's a young industry. You know, we all like to think that we're super sophisticated, but I think we're, you know, I don't know it depends when you think software started, but let's say it started in the 50s. We've been going for 70 years. Well, hold on, we're still learning about civil engineering and we started building stuff 4,500 BC, you know, of scale, you know, and <laughs> we're not there yet. So we, we need to be ambitious, but I think we've got to be realistic that we're still going to have these struggles. But, you know, certainly beyond my lifetime, I mean, maybe Jonathan, you'll live longer. Well, I hope you do. Uh, and well, you'll see you'll see more progress. But I, I think we'll be having these conversations in 25 years time easily, easily. Yeah, I mean, no, unless I, something I, absolutely remarkable happens. I mean, um, you know. I think, you know, I, I, I put, I remember, uh, I, I always kind of put the same quote into to most of the books that I did, the book that I did with Dorothy Graham, it's kind of saying that the tools and technologies that, that worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. And, and, you know, I think that is exactly what you're saying there is that we've got to arm ourselves with the capability to be able to pivot uh, and learn new skills uh take on new challenges and you know again uh, the theo kind of talked about those organizational structures you go to one organization it's going to work in a completely different way to the other you know i think part of it is we need to have that ability where we're versatile and we we arm ourselves with these cognitive and digital skills that actually allow us to to be able to contribute to um whatever kind of challenge we face next and i think there's a lot of challenges that that are coming along, and you know we've I, I guess all the great talk speakers during this event have talked about um, you know various different uh, methodologies and approaches and experiences, and like you said, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, but at the same time, I think part of it is the idea of these events is to is to challenge those those norms, to challenge and ask questions and say you know the approach that maybe we were doing before. You know, can it be improved? Can we, you know, go back in and and look at a new way or a new opportunity to improve that? Um, mm. And you know, I think what your your new model for testing was kind of helped uh, push the industry into kind of saying, yes, you've got to you've got to examine those things, you've got to survey things, you've got to really start uh, approaching this in a, in a way that you're not just told to do something in the same way and expect that you have to do it like that. You know, part of it is to ask questions, which I know the, the the audience have been fantastic about asking questions and challenging some of those 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 basic principles. Uh, and I think you know we are on a brisk of uh, of a new era. I mean, and, and I know 
we're going to try and get back together in February 17th to, to, to uh, for, for the re-signing of, of a, a digital manifesto to start taking <laughs> some of those lessons we've done with, you know, with DevOps, with, you know, all uh, with cognitive technologies that are coming through with, you know, AI, machine learning, RPA, and start sharing some of those ideas about what 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 it means today to be um, a technologist uh, yeah. and also somebody who works for an organization that adds value to its customers. So I know we're at the nearly at the top of the hour and we've got some some live giveaways to give away. But you know, can, do you want to give us a kind of a summary of, you know, uh, our final thoughts about, you know, where is the industry going and, 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 and where do you think we, we need to be thinking what we need to be thinking about? Um, well, I, OK, so the things that are in my head right now, just off the top of my head, um, is when you ask a developer, anyone who writes code, how they get from an idea or a requirement to a delivered piece of software, um, very few developers can explain that thought process because they haven't thought it through. It's almost like um, yeah, we don't have like, you know, you ask an artist how they paint a picture and they can tell you, well, I do the broad brush, you know, I, I, I whitewash the page I sketch out the structure of the painting and you know and I work on the trees and the background first and then I do on the detail I, you know they'll give you a method but developers can't do that we haven't thought it through uh, we haven't thought software development through to the degree that we can explain how we do this piece of magic now what's interesting from the so I'm a developer you know so I'm and I'm like that I can't explain how I could write a piece of code uh, so that you would understand how I thought my way through that problem I don't think that's very easy to do at all. The thing is, um, I think where we're lucky as testers is we have a kind of simpler thought process to go through, but we have very high levels of complexity to deal with. And so I think, and, and we deal with that by modeling, you know, test modeling, let's call it. So I think, you know, in, in some respects, the, the, the testers are, are a bit more ahead in the game the developers and if we can solve this problem of how we test complex stuff I think that could help how our developers to understand how they build the damn thing in a systematic or a more systematic and reliable way rather than relying on very mechanical tools like source control yes really important but it keeps us out of trouble and endless regression testing in a test driven development I mean yeah we rely on um, you know, um, elephant gun kind of approaches to deal with things that really should never happen, you know, and the whole configuration management challenge that, that we always have, you know, that these are, we have incredibly complex tools to deal with stuff that really ought to be very simple, you know, uh, you know, when you say no one touch this code, uh, you know, uh, or it might cause the, uh, or this, this stone, you know, because it might cause the whole cathedral co collapse in a pile of rubble, um, we don't have these kind of safety nets that we can take for granted. We're still, uh, you know, adopting very technical um, elephant gun approaches to problems, some of which are about discipline and some of them are human problems of communication. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, Weinberg said very, very astutely, all problems are human problems. And we're still, as a technology industry, trying to solve everything with a with a technology, whether it's a process or a tool or a, 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 a development approach or whatever, we still obsess about technical solutions to human problems. And that's where we're going wrong. And I think Dave's stuff, he's endlessly pointing that out. You know, it's, we should be thinking about the human factor much more than the technology and the um, even, the, even the business. I mean, he, you know, I mean, I think he said as much, you know, when uh, he, he, he touched upon, you know, uh, business people having um, analytical skills to define requirements. It's unreasonable for us to think they can do that. I'm done. <laughs> absolutely. Well, that was an absolutely fantastic live stream podcast. Thanks, Paul, for, again, amazing hosting of day three of the virtual community days and also uh, an amazing podcast. So we're going to cut it there. We're going to cut the live stream. We're going to hand that back now to um, the staff. Uh, I've actually got to go and jump onto a North America conference to talk about intelligent and robotic process automation. Um, but it's been another fantastic day. 
and uh, I want to thank. And I know that probably uh, we've got some prizes to give. I don't know if you can stick around, Paul, to to facilitate that with the staff. Um, but um, again, massive thank you for for uh, a great day. Thanks, mate. <laughs>